Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help executives become better cyber risk managers. We are your hosts. I'm Kip Boyle, CEO of Cyber Risk Opportunities. And I'm Jake Bernstein, Cybersecurity Counsel at the law firm of Newman Duors. And this is the show where we help you become a better cyber risk manager. The show is sponsored by Cyber Risk Opportunities and Newman Duors LLP. If you have questions about your cybersecurity related legal responsibilities, and if you want to manage your cyber risks just as thoughtfully as you manage risks in other areas of your business, such as sales, accounts receivable, and order fulfillment, then you should become a member of our Cyber Risk Managed Program, which you can do for a fraction of the cost of hiring a single cybersecurity expert. You can find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. So, Kev, what are we going to talk about today? Okay, Jake, today we're going to talk about the past because, as uh, we all know, that um, you need to understand history in order to understand the future. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I think all too often uh, we, uh, as humans, tend to forget the history. So, so what past are we talking about? Well, we're only going to go back about 30 years. And uh, for some of our listeners, I think, you know, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, 30 years. I remember that, you know. And then for other listeners, they're going to be like, uh, I don't think I was born then. <laughs> well, I was born, but I was a kid. So uh, why don't you <laughs> tell me what happened 30 years ago that's interesting for cybersecurity? Yeah. So uh, we're talking about 1986. Um so in 1986, there's this cybersecurity inflection point that stands out to me um, and is worthy of reflecting on in our, in our show today because, um, well, we'll get into that, but let me just tell you what the inflection point is. Um, there is a book, in fact, that uh, documents this, and it's the theft of military technologies, secret technologies, and it was an online uh, theft in 1986, believe it or not, and it was, a, it was a crime committed by a group that became known as the Hanover Hackers, and Hanover being a city in Germany that they were associated with. The book uh, it's documented in is called The Cuckoo's Egg. You can still find it on Amazon. It's, um, it's still in print. The author is, a na uh, is named Cliff Stoll, S-T-O-L-L. -L. Cliff is uh, an astronomer. Actually, he was an out-of-work astronomer uh, when, uh, when, he, when he stumbled into this uh, online theft. And the book is, is all about uh, what happened. Wait a second. Were there, was there an internet in 1986? <laughs> Actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, there was. Um, so before the internet as we know it today, uh, the internet actually uh, used to be called DARPAnet, DARPA uh, as an acronym for um, Defense Advanced uh, Research Projects. Um, I probably butchered the hell out of that acronym just now. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there, there actually was, uh, starting in uh, 1969, I believe, uh, was the first attempt to connect computers over long distance. And by 1986, uh, that uh, those connections were uh, alive and well. Uh, it was a, a mashup of, of dial-up modems, uh, expensive leased lines. But yeah, we had a we had a nascent global internet in 1986. That's uh, that's interesting, and I have to admit that the Cuckoo's Egg is actually the next book on my reading list, but I haven't read it yet. So, what's so special about this book? All right. Well, there's a lot of cool things about this book. So, um, first of all, it's a great read. Uh, I don't know if Cliff Stoll had a um, had anybody helping him, but in addition to being an out of work astronomer, uh, he's also a very good author. And so, it, you know, one of the things I love about this book is anybody can pick it up and read it and understand it. He does a very very good job of breaking down the technology that he, that you know inevitably is discussed in the book uh, into concepts that can be understood by anybody and that's particularly needed today because a lot of the technology uh, was was pretty old <laughs> that is actually amazing because uh, I mean I had a computer in probably the late late 80s maybe 89 and and I recall it was maybe a Tandy from Radio Shack and I don't think it had I think it only had like a quarter or three or I'm sorry a five and a quarter inch disk drive I mean basically we're talking about stone stone tools <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah yeah definitely so, 
so that was one thing about the book. And I, I, I commend everybody to go and get this book. It's a paperback book. It's going to cost you nothing to, to get it. And you're going to, you're going to be, not only are you going to be entertained, um, but you're going to get, uh, you're going to get a lot of the details that we're going to talk about in our episode today. And um, so, so that's, one reason why this book is so special it's eminently readable and um and and i you know and it's worth your time but the other reason why this is such a a special um inflection point is because many of the techniques that were used by the hanover hackers in uh the theft of these secret military technologies are in use by cyber attackers today and many of the things that cliff stole did to discover this and to track them down and ultimately uh, achieve uh, not only a stop of the Hanover hackers, but actually convictions, uh, you know, legal convictions, uh, we're still using the same techniques today. Yeah, interesting. And in fact, this book is not just available on a paperback. It's been, it's been translated to modern technology, so you can buy it on Kindle too. Ah, okay, good. And, so, and just, just so everyone is clear, we have absolutely no interest in the book sales at all. We just think it's a cool book. Right. I mean, if you if you uh, if you go buy this book, we'll earn nothing. <laughs> but but hopefully, Mr. Stoll is is still earning something off this book. Uh, it's it's that good. But um, but l let me give you some examples. You know, I told you that. Um, that many of the things that the book talks about are actually still in use today. I've, obviously, the technology has changed a tremendous amount, but the core concepts, believe it or not, have not changed. Um, so first of all, as we already said, there was a global computer network in right. Dar DARPANET. Yeah, in 1986. And what was happening? A foreign government was conducting espionage against the United States through a global computer network in 1986, and that's still going on today. Not only it's still going on today, it's, I mean, that was probably, I don't know, if we, don't, we may never know if that was a one-off in 1986, but let's just say that it's, it's happening every millisecond of every day. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, back then it was uh, Soviet spies, uh, you know, uh, or their, um, their proxies in Germany, right? Um, but today, well, that, that would have been East Germany for uh, the, those not old enough to remember the difference. That's right. In 1986, Germany was still partitioned into two countries as a result of um, the fallout of World, World War II. And uh, yeah, so we had East Germany and East Berlin under the influence of the Soviet Union and West Berlin and West Germany under the influence of uh, the Western allies, the United States, Great Britain, and France. So, um, yeah, and Hanover, I believe at the time, was located in, in, in East Germany. And um, so, well, of course, today, what do we have? We've got uh, every nation on the face of the planet has spun up a, uh, an espionage capability based on the, uh, the internet and the high speed and um, well, and it's, reach. And it's and it's more accessible than ever. I mean, you don't need to be a rich, wealthy, first world nation to engage in cyber espionage. And North nope. Korea has proven that uh, better than anyone. Right. And in fact, uh, technology is so comparatively easy today that um, you don't even need to be technologically proficient. I mean, if you can go down to a store and, you know, online or, or otherwise, buy a computer and plug it into a high speed internet connection, you know, uh, you're you're good to go. So uh, back in 1986, it took a lot of special skills, but clearly it doesn't anymore. A lot of special Another, equipment too was probably very expensive, and all of yep. that has changed. Uh, I would say completely. Yeah, and and you, and if you read the book, you'll see how Cliff had to type, you know, commands at a at a you know command line. There, there's no graphical user interfaces available. But um, hey, let's be honest. Everyone who really knows how to use a computer still uses the command line, right? <laughs> That's the joke, at least. <laughs> That's the joke, at least, right? Yeah. I can't even remember the last time I typed a command. <laughs> anyway, uh, so here's something else that, was, uh, that, you'll, that you'll read about in the book that still is going on, which is the attackers, the Hanover uh, hackers, actually used multiple hops through several different computers 
before they actually attacked. And why did they do that? Because they knew that it would be very difficult to dis discover who they were if they went through other computers before they actually attacked, right? So this anonymity was definitely going on back then and is still going on now. Yeah, it's uh, that's a uh, that's a super useful technique. It's uh, it's you know VPNs uh, are a little different, but if you look around, you can hop through different VPN networks if you want to really conceal your your origin. In fact, the entire Tor network, the, the Tor browser, isn't that its entire function is to basically. Mm -hmm automatically route you through you know tens if not dozens upon dozens of, of uh, locations yeah you can uh, you can actually control that and um, and so you know there's obviously um, advantages to anonymity in in the world today we want we want there to be the opportunity to be anonymous in certain cases but obviously it's um, not a good it's not a good feature of the internet when uh, it's being used by malicious people, but you know that's still going on today. Um, another example of, and by the way, uh, Cliff Stoll spends a great chunk of the book <clears throat> trying to figure out how to de-anonymize the attackers so that he can figure out where they're coming from, and and that's part of the thrill of reading that book is 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 uh, is watching him uh, try all kinds of different uh, techniques uh, in order to figure this out. But the other thing that uh, another thing that these cyber attackers were doing in 1986 is they were landing on um, you know computers you typically with guest accounts uh, or open logins. Uh, many of the computers back in 1986 did not require you to identify yourself in order to get onto the computer. The internet was built uh, not with confidentiality in mind. It was built to share information. And so what would happen is, is the Hanover hackers would land on a computer and then they would uh, perform some kind of an exploit in order to turn their privileges from, uh, from regular to uh, to administrator or you know as as cliff talks about it root or super user there's different there's different names for a highly privileged privileged account but the point is is that they had they had to escalate their privileges over and over and over again and that, that's exactly what happens today so okay you said earlier that mr stoll was an astronomer and he was out of work how did he get involved in this yeah, so really, really interesting uh, documented in, in the book. So uh, he was uh, working on some basic astronomy. His, his government funding ran out, and uh, he didn't know when he was going to get more funding to work on, you know, good old-fashioned astronomy. And so uh, <laughs> he needed to eat. So he went looking around the university. I believe he was uh, working at uh, at Berkeley at the time. So he went around the university looking for, you know, something to do to earn some money while he waited for his next uh, grant, his next uh, science grant to show up. And lo and behold, you know, they had a computer center and there, there was uh, work to be done. Now it was not glamorous work by, by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, this leads us into something else that, that was going on in 1986 that still goes on today, which is, um, the, the way that, that Cliff Stoll figured out that something fishy was going on is one of his tasks was to uh, reconcile uh, the accounting of computer time so that when the different departments in the university were charged for the time that they spent using the computer, wait, wait, wait. those charges were accurate. People used to get charged by the minute for using a computer? Yeah, that's right. Just like uh, people used to get charged by the minute to make long distance phone calls. <laughs> Both of those things seem very strange to uh, even to me as as a, as a child of the '80s, but my kids would have absolutely no understanding of that concept at all. Yeah, but technology used to be really expensive, and so uh, and it had to be paid for somehow. And so there were all these chargeback schemes, as they were called, and uh, and people wanted to make sure that they got a bill that was accurate, right? And so um, you know, this is not glamorous work by any stretch of the imagination. No, this sounds horrible. No, it's it, it was it was very, it was very tedious. But uh, as an astronomer, uh, you know he was kind of used to tedium, uh, so, it was, so it wasn't so bad for him. Um, but he talks about how he discovered he was he was reconciling two chargeback systems, and he found a seventy-five cent accounting error 
And he just started scratching and scratching and scratching into that. 75 cents, even in 1986, wasn't that much money. No, uh, that, that's <laughs> definitely one of those things like where it gets into your head, it burrows in there, and it just bothers you. And you spend way much, he, way more time thinking about it than it is worth. But, yep. What, where did it lead him? Yeah, so uh, if I remember correctly in the book, you know, his, his supervisor is like, 75 cents is not material, don't worry about it. But, uh, but you're right, Cliff could not let it go. And so he just went uh, crazy trying to figure out um, what was up with that 75 cent error. But I, you know, what this, what this um, points out is the importance of event logging, uh, conducting regular event reviews and um, and promptly investigating uh, suspicious uh, system events, and we still need to do that today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, that is, I, I would say, in that sense, nothing has changed. I mean, in order to investigate a cyber attack, you follow the trail of clues, just like any other police investigator has for for you know hundred years. Right. Now, the, the difference today, of course, is that the amount of logging that we're um, having to deal with is just overwhelming. I mean, uh, human beings are not good at doing log reviews, period, no matter how long those logs are. I mean, you go over just a handful or, you know, a dozen of, um, of, of lines of detail and, and people's eyes just glaze over. So, yeah. but today we've got logging that is pulling in terabytes of, of data, you know, by the day, by the hour, depending on, you know, how, how aggressive you're getting uh, on this. And, and really machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to be very, very important going forward in uh, looking for those needles in all of these haystacks, right? So the scale of this is definitely different than it was back in uh, the time of the cuckoo's egg, but uh, yep. Yep, still, still a deal. Uh, here's another example. Um, today we talk about active defense and active defense. Some people think of it as a uh, hacking back, you know, like you, you, you attack my computer, I'm going to attack you back to right. make you go away. Well, so active defense is, is actually a, a better term than hack back. And I don't think they're synonymous, but active defense is sort of a gray zone between p passive defenses like a firewall and, um, uh, and offensive uh, actions like hacking back. But inside of active defense, we have a, uh, an idea of a honeypot. And a honeypot is a, like a, a cache of fake documents or maybe even a fake computer that looks real to an attacker. And the idea of a honeypot is you want to put out something that attackers will find pretty quickly that looks very, very interesting to them. And what it does is it slows them down. And, um, and it gives you an opportunity to know that they're in your network and then to do something about it. You know, whether it's, hey, I'm going to study the attacker and try to understand, you know, uh, what, what their intent is or, um, you know, or, or hey, I'm, I'm just going to let them get away with this fake data um, because then, you know, they're, then they're going to maybe not come back and, and get my real stuff. But, um, but Cliff stole and <laughs> created a honeypot. Um, of fake documents and what he did is while these hackers were pouring over the fake documents trying to decide you know is, is this uh, are these files describing a military technology that we want while they were doing that Cliff Stoll uh, initiated uh, tracking um, and he actually pioneered <clears throat> something that had n really never been done before which is um, AT&T was the uh, the dominant uh, carrier at the time this is again before we had multiple competing telephone companies um, sorry people not old enough to remember that but <laughs> uh, so he got AT&T the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the West German government to take this seriously and to actually trace the phone lines that were being used and the leased lines and the telecom uh, all the way back to Germany, all the way back to Hanover, across international lines. Um, and it was the use of this honeypot that, that created the opportunity for him to do this. And it took months, by the way, as, you, as you'll read in the book. And, and yeah, we're so, still doing this today. So, I mean, so, I mean, that's a good point. I think it's important to realize that, that 
you know, any arrest and conviction of a cyber attacker these days um, is the result of heroic efforts. That's why they make a good story. That's why people go to um, conferences and, and you know, this, these stories can serve as keynote addresses to, to the audience because they are so fascinating and so heroic. But that is, um, that's maybe a little distressing that given the technology change that we aren't any better at tracking these, these, these guys down. So, so what does the cuckoo's egg tell us about the future of cyber risk? It, it, it seems a little frightening maybe. Yeah. Well, so it, it, I think it tells us a few things. One thing that, that it tells us is <clears throat> cyber risks are getting worse, not better. I agree with that. Um, why do we say that though? Well, so I, I don't believe that humanity has really effectively dealt with a fundamental shift in reality that occurred with the rise of the internet. And we can see it in 1986 in its very, very limited deployment, right? Very, very limited number of nodes on the internet back then. And, and, and we're just starting to see this fundamental shift in reality. And, and now it's really on us. And I think um, until we deal with this shift, I mean, we're just, it's just gonna keep getting worse. And here's the shift, <clears throat> crime, and military action is now independent of geography, both in terms of reach and in terms of speed. And I would add to that, so is, so is communication in general and even more importantly, economic action and commerce. Well, and that's all. the beauty of it, right? That that's is what, the beauty of it. But, that's you know, what makes and, the internet great. It, it is. And, you know, I've got some, I have some thoughts on this, which is, you know, one, um, you, you, you talked about a shift of reality. Well, you know, in the next 30 years, we are going to be wearing augmented reality headsets that modify what we see with our eyes based upon a computer. And if that is hackable, then, you know, that might be, that, that idea becomes a lot less philosophical when what you actually see could change and be faked based upon the internet. Right. So, so that's a point right there. You talk about a, you talk about crime and, and, military action uh, across the internet at light speed what if uh, what if I'm able to when you're driving your car or, or maybe when your car is driving itself just up and decide to tell your car that there is a wall in front of it and it needs to turn left into an actual wall I mean there's there's all kinds of ways that you literally affect reality yeah um, right because because these cars these autonomous vehicles are gonna have sensors and it's that sensor that if you can fool it, if you can, if you can actually convince it that it's receiving data other than what is, you know, what it should be receiving, what the reality of the situation is, then you can trigger all mm. kinds of interesting effects with the vehicle, just like you described. And so, um, and, and that's really no different from today, right? When I attack no. a computer, I'm, I'm faking that computer out. I'm giving it um, all kinds of crazy input, and I'm making it do things that, that well, the people who stood that computer up never intended for it to do. And, and let's be honest, that's, it's not just cars. I mean, we already have um, augmentations that give us you know, the ability to see in light spectra that normal human eyes can't see in, but it's all electronic, right? It's not, it does not, it, it, isn't, even, it isn't even a stretch to assume that, that someone could be given ultrasonic sight to compensate for blindness and that that system could be hacked. So clearly this is a, um, uh, it's not just that the cyber risks, uh, they're, they're not getting worse just because there's more of them. They're getting worse because they will be able to affect a much larger percentage of life. Right. So as we take all of the wonderful things that the internet has given to us and build on those wonderful things uh, as a foundation, right, we start building on top of that. The, um, this fundamental shift of reality continues to affect all of those things. Anything you build on, build on top of the internet is going to inherit the, the, uh, the independent uh, of geography nature of the internet and there's other fundamental differences but i think that one's really important because what it means is that if i'm sitting here in my uh in my house with my vr headset on and i don't have protection then that means that potentially somebody in another part of the world can uh, mess with my headset 
uh, yeah. which would never be possible before the rise of the internet. Yeah, and and you know, from a, I, I have experienced the difference that the internet makes in the court system and in, and in the practice of law, really for the last uh, 10, 11 years. And let me tell you that the, you know, traditional jurisprudence and, and law about personal jurisdiction and where you can be sued and, you know, the, the reach of our court system uh, is completely tied in knots when you introduce the internet and it, whether it's a civil lawsuit against a potential scammer or if it's a criminal lawsuit and you're trying to arrest someone, we have Interpol, we have, you know, we, we have certain international bodies, but let's be honest, um, the, the legal systems that we've set up cannot handle a global internet where I can be sitting in a non non extradition, you know, hostile country, to the U.S. and do things to the U.S. Right. With impunity. Yeah. Impunity. And that's part of this geographical uh, shift, right, is that not only does it let me um, reach with, with light speed places on the globe that you know, I could never have done before, but it also frees me from the geographic realities of international borders and everything that's built on international borders like, uh, like law enforcement and, um, and governance. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's a big part of it. So, okay, so we, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced, you're convinced. Um, the internet changes things. It's a revolution in conflict, you might say. What does that mean for the future? Well, so um, I, you know, very few of us alive are alive now that remember um, the emergence of n nuclear weapons and what a fundamental shift of, of of reality that was. So, 1945, right? We explode the first atomic bombs, and 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 we've struggled ever since to figure out how to govern these things um, so that we don't destroy each other. And particularly in the beginning, every, I mean, it, you know, nobody really knew what to do. And I think we're repeating um, a similar path where we had to figure out how to harness nuclear weapons. I would submit we still don't really have, have them under complete control, but, but we've figured out how to deal with them to, uh, to a certain degree. We're gonna need to figure out how to deal with this revolution and conflict. And I think we're just at the very beginnings of, of doing that. And I think we're, it's gonna take um, at least the next 30 years to, to sort this out. Uh, it's taken you know, 30 years to get to this point and I'm sorry to say, but I just don't see any quick, easy answers on the horizon. So I'm, I'm going to forecast another 30 years before we get to um, a good place. I think so. And, and you know, I, I think that um, we don't, we haven't had the, um, we, we haven't had the, the end of World War II experience with cyber war yet. Um, it's, it's all been very small scale. Um, it's been very, you know, it, there's been painful attacks, uh, you know, particularly in the Ukraine, but in terms of a worldwide, oh my God, let's not do that again. That has not happened yet. No. And it's, um, so you're right. We're, at, we're, it's early stages. Um, you know, unlike nuclear weapons, cyber war and, and cyber weapons are much more scalable. You might say, um, you can well, have, yeah pinpoint attacks you can have large scale damage whereas a nuke is a is a, a nuke is a weapon of mass destruction period right um, well and digital weapons can lead to mass casualty oh, we, they saw can. With, we saw that with not petcha but one thing about about cyber weapons that's very different from nuclear weapons is um <laughs> It's very hard for a nuclear weapon to fall into the hands of a, a you know a small band of guerrilla fighters, and that they would be able to use that credibly to um, you know to to take yeah. over. Um, I mean, now, it, maybe but, you say suitcase sized nukes and, and that sort of business, but but even still, I mean, it takes a lot of special talent and special handling uh, in order to do anything with a, a nuclear device compared to. Um, what happens when a, when a nuclear when a cyber weapon uh, gets uh, dropped into the hands of of ordinary criminals? Yeah, no, it's it's very true, and and it's you know the fear of the suitcase bomb 
is a uh, it is you know couldn't be more obvious in in popular culture. There, I can't even count the number of novels, movies, uh, video games, etc., where the the central plot is this idea, right? Yep. Um, but yet in cyber, uh, it's it's almost like it's already such reality that it's not even worth writing movies about. Um, there aren't many, you know, the, the popular, in terms of pop culture, most of the time it's wrong when it comes to cyber weapons, which I think is an interesting, an interesting uh, fact to point out in this podcast, because what it, what it means is that not even our, not even our fiction writers know what it means yet. No, I mean, cyber is very abstract, very difficult to comprehend. The, the consequences of cyber uh, battles are, are not often uh, tangible. They're, they're, I mean, today, the, the, the big consequences are really data breaches, but people are pretty well insulated from the consequences of data breaches to this point. So it's irritating, annoying, and so forth, but it has, hasn't actually caused anybody any uh, great cost right so like i'm not sure that we've had um death you know uh or mass property destruction yet as a reason you know as a direct consequence of cyber attacks at, at least not in the u.s I, I think that there are stories at least that that the russian a russian cyber weapon was able to shut down heating in ukraine in the middle right. of winter which right almost certainly caused death but none that none that we have been apprised yeah, of. But, but I think the links there, you're probably right, but I think even the links there are kind of weak. People, they are. Pe people would say, well, they, you know, the person died because the heat was off. And, well, and, which is know, true. <laughs> which is true, but you've got you know, to unpack that a little bit more. Well, and, and, the, and, the, yes. and the evidence isn't, isn't as conclusive, right? We can look at the evidence and say, we're pretty sure this is what happened. But unlike a bomb, there's no crater, right? There's no smoking hole in the ground that says, this is what happened, and we're going to collect the bomb fragments, and we're going to analyze them, and then we're going to uh, at least not at least not yet. I mean, yeah. it, it, with the NotPetya attack, there kind of was. We knew. I mean, there was there was smoking holes blown into balance sheets right. around various right. corporations. Yeah, and, it, uh, it was a ten billion dollar uh, yeah. co collective damage, and yet what happened? Nothing. Nothing. There was no repercussion for having released that there was no um no sanctions you know i mean really nothing happened as a result of it and i think people ordinary people when they see no repercussions from one government to the next as a result of a cyber attack it makes them it just reinforces the idea that this stuff's ethereal and doesn't matter yeah and and you know even if there was a reaction it was not publicized which means that if it wasn't if it didn't have at least 10 minutes of media tech media time, it didn't happen. Right. But looking into, so looking into the future, I just, I see more ambiguity, more gray, but also more consequences, more, more real world consequences from cyber attacks. Um, the lot, you know, not only the loss of data and the loss of money, but you know, the loss of life, the loss of, 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 of infrastructure, right? In other words, we can't, you know, the power is going to go out and it's going to stay out for days and then water pressure is going to drop and then people are going to have to be carrying water in buckets. And I mean, it's, it's, I think something like that's probably going to need to happen in order for people to really feel it viscerally, like this has got to change. And even at that yep. point, we won't have any, an easy answer. No. I mean, we're going to have new technologies. We mentioned artificial intelligence, machine learning and all that. But we, but we, what we desperately need is a new way to govern ourselves. It's true, and you know, it's it's interesting. You think about when that happens from a natural disaster. You know, there's been a lot of hurricanes recently that have caused incredible damage. The fires in California. You know, what happens? The world knows. Everyone sees it. There are emergencies declared. The law take you know, uh, legal mechanisms go into action to release funds. Um, uh, donation drives occur. People are emotionally affected. Imagine if the power goes out for no other reason than someone decided they didn't like us and they wanted to fire off a cyber weapon at us. That would change people's perceptions. Yeah, I think, I think it would. And, and I think that's where we're going to have to be um, in order to, to do something. But um, the, the one thing that I do want to highlight uh, in, in our episode before we do a wrap is there are some people who are trying to um, 
tackle this, which I applaud anybody who has a great idea who'd like to try to figure out, you know, how do we find a better way to govern ourselves? Um, Brad Smith, who's Microsoft's president and chief legal officer, is actively pursuing on the international stage something that he's calling a digital Geneva Convention. And I think we absolutely need things like this. I agree. I, I think that, um, you know, in in this world, we must have the, the only thing that, you know, we're a world of laws. And even though not every nation is a nation of laws, you know, that's that's how we govern ourselves. And, and some kind of digital Geneva Convention is, it, we, we need to update international law to not only protect people, but also to prosecute uh, offenders to to punish nations that violate these norms right um, you know l look at the response that that uh, President Trump unleashed on uh, the Syrian military when it was you know strongly strongly concluded without even necessarily being hard proof that chemical weapons were used that's a violation of international norms international law and I think that the response that prompted was quite real. Uh, dozens of cruise missiles were fired from American warships uh, yeah. directly into Syria. You know, I'm not saying that that's what was going to happen, but it's going to have to be something similar so that there are consequences for using these types of, of weapons. Yeah, for using, for using cyber weapons to cause mass cyber damage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Today we talked about what the next 30 years of cyber risk may have in store for us. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks everybody for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport and needs to incorporate management, your legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. And management's goal should be to create an environment where practicing good cyber hygiene is supported and encouraged by every employee. So if you want to manage your cyber risks and ensure that your company enjoys the benefits of good cyber hygiene, then please contact us and consider becoming a member of our Cyber Risk Managed program. You can find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.